Flip It Red California. I'm Ann Elizabeth. I'm one of the moderators here at Flip It Red, where our goal is to flip as many seats from blue to red as possible. Today, we are speaking with Greg Rath. Greg is running for Congress against Democrat incumbent Katie Porter in the 45th District. The 45th District encompasses parts of Orange County, including all of Irvine, Tustin, North Tustin, Villa Park, Laguna Hills, Lake Forest, and Rancho Santa Margarita, as well as parts of Anaheim, Orange, Laguna Woods, Mission Viejo, and Laguna Niguel. Greg is a very decorated and retired Marine fighter pilot and colonel, completing 75 combat missions, wow. Went on to serve as Chief of Staff to the White House Military Office from 1996 to 1999. After, Greg went on to fly commercially and then own his own business. Now, Greg, you are a mayor of Mission Viejo, and this is well worth mentioning, Greg, that as mayor since 2019, you've reduced crime by 27%. Then by 2019, your budget already had a $6 million surplus. Greg says in his bio that his key issues are permanently to lower individual taxes, raise business deductions, and stop illegal immigration. Also, Greg will fight the lower healthcare premiums and prescription drug prices, expand coverage to pre-existing conditions, and allow every American to access low group rates Greg is now turning his sights to Congress and believes he has what it takes to get our house back on track to the key issues. So Greg, please tell us in your own words why you are running for Congress. It's very simple. I've been a servant my whole life. I started at age eight as a uh, Cub Scout and then as an Eagle Scout. So when I joined the Boy Scouts and went into politics in high school as my class president, I uh, then joined the military when I was a sophomore at Arizona State University. I joined the officer program to serve my country, and I went to flight school, became a jet fighter pilot, a Top Gun pilot, and my first duty station is right here in Southern California, uh, flying the F-4 Phantom. I then moved up to the F-18 Hornet. So I served from 72 to 2004 in the military. And uh, then I went on to, as you said, as a, a pilot for uh, JetBlue Airways and then uh, ran my own business, president of the company. So it's just a, a part of my life. I want to continue to serve. And I know people right now are looking for leadership. They're looking for someone to, to be their voice in uh, Washington. And I can be that voice. I do have, like you said, I have Washington experience. I picked up a master's degree at National Defense University in Washington, D.C. when I was a lieutenant colonel. And then I got assigned to the White House at the, you uh, know, I worked in the East Wing I worked as Assistant Chief of Staff and then Chief of Staff of the White House Military Office. That position was we gave the Commander in Chief, the President, the Vice President, Senior Cabinet members, uh, members of Congress, military support. If the, we, the President needed to go away on Air Force One, make sure his airplane was ready, I would travel with him on all the trips. Camp David's run by the Navy, uh, his medical team are all military, his communication team is all Army. So there's about every, on a, a single day, there's about 2,200 active duty military personnel that support the commander in chief in the White House. And I oversaw that whole operation. So I know Washington, I, I spent three years at the White House. I've worked with Congress, I've worked with the State Department, I've worked in the Pentagon. So we need some good leadership in Washington and our current Congresswoman is a freshman. She has been a big disappointment. So my job is to ensure that she's a one-term Congresswoman. So Greg, let's first talk about taxes because California is the highest tax state in the country. They aren't even being allocated effectively and it's one of the many things that are hurting the middle class. So what is California doing? It is so sad. We, we saw what happened uh, in the last few years. They spent, I, I believe the final figure is 22 billion with the B dollars for this high rail train from supposed to go from LA to San Francisco in two hours and never got off the ground. Billions of dollars were wasted. And right now, as we sit, we cannot even provide enough power to the people in California. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. And we cannot even provide enough power for our citizens. That's just a joke. And that's poor leadership in Sacramento by our governor and by the uh, supermajority assembly and, and democratic run Senate. So it's, uh, it's a problem, but uh, at my level, at the city level, as Mayor of Mission Viejo, like you said, we're able to rein in spending. It's easy as a, as a elected official, it's easy to spend other people's money. And that's the problem in Sacramento and that's the problem in Washington. But when taxpayers gave money to my city, Mission Viejo, 
I ensured that that money was spent correctly and wisely. And at the end of the year, we had $6 million left over that we did not spend. And that is unheard of in government, as you, as you see what's going on in Sacramento. And obviously, Washington's in $26 trillion with a T dollars in debt. Greg, let's discuss immigration. You said, make no mistake. I'm empathetic to the obstacles of our neighboring nations. However, it is my civic duty to serve the people of our country first. Serving the people of the United States of America is my number one priority. Similarly, it is my recommendation that other nations should step up so that their vulnerable population is not forced to break our laws, such as crossing the border illegally. I thought this was so empathetic to people coming over while explaining the importance of enforcing the law and even addressing why it's happening. So let's talk about it. Well, in my 30 years in the military, my time at the White House, I've visited 63 countries around the world. I've been around the world in every country I've been to, all the people I talk to, well, not all, but most, they all want to come to America. You heard the term, the American dream. You don't hear about the French dream or the Saudi Arabian dream. You hear about the American dream. So obviously people want to come here and immigrate to our country. And we're very immigration friendly. We, we have before COVID, obviously, we, we didn't have enough actually workers for the jobs that were available. So I'm very pro-immigration, but I'm very pro-legal immigration. There's a correct way to do it. And our president has finally got a hold of the southern border and putting a clamp on all the illegals that are, are coming through the southern border, but to also he's put a clamp on all the drugs and human trafficking that's come through the south. But one thing that people don't talk about and when it comes to immigration is those that come here on a visa. They come here on a student visa or a work visa, and they just overstay their visa, and they just stay in America. 50% of all Ill Ill illegal immigration comes through that program. And our State Department that runs the uh, passport system and the, National, uh, the Homeland Security, they need to get a handle on that, and they're working on it and doing a really good job, but that's where the major problem is. Northern border, we're sitting pretty good. The southern border is where the problem is, but we have now 300 miles of wall, which is really good. It's stopping a lot of the... Uh, the illegal immigration coming through that area, but do we have a ways to go. But I believe in legal immigration, period. Moving on to healthcare, you mentioned that it's one of the top two issues for all Americans who are firm in saying everyone has the right to affordable healthcare. No man or woman should be left behind. So our healthcare system has been through the ringer, hasn't it? And it's overwhelmed with rules, laws, regulations that now private premiums are almost a joke unaffordable deductibles to boot, and then mandated health care is typically less quality care or people don't want it. So what can we do? We really need a full revamp, don't we? Did you remember the term, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor? Remember that? Or everyone's going to pay $2,500 less for medical insurance? Wrong. When the federal government tries to do everything at once when it comes to medical uh, expenses and uh, health care, they screw it up. They screwed it up from day one when they put the uh, website up that cost $1 billion for a website. My website I use for my campaign, $9.95 a month on GoDaddy. So when the government's involved, that's where the problem will, problems arise. But instead of going this overwhelming, this large, big healthcare program, let's attack one at a time. Medicare is doing really well. Uh, there is a chance it may start running out of money, so we need to start adjusting the the premiums there and uh, get with the providers and ensure that they're not overcharging. So those 65 and older are taken care of. Medicaid's looking good. Those that are less advantaged and, and they don't have the money to, to buy insurance. The veteran VA system is amazing compared to what was uh, four years ago uh, when uh, President Obama left and President Trump is totally turning around. I personally use the VA system because I want to see how it works. I go to Long Beach we have a, uh, a clinic in, the, in Laguna Hills, and it's doing a great job. And then you have the uh, companies that provide insurance for their, uh, for their workers, and that, that program is going very well. But it's those people that are, make too much for Medicaid. They're not 65. They don't work for a company that provides health care, and they're not a veteran that we need to focus on because their insurance premiums are way too high. They're up to about $1,800 a month at some of these uh, uh, programs with two, three kids. So I, as a legislator in Washington, I will work with the, with, the, with the House of Representatives to come up with a plan to help reduce the cost of those that purchase health insurance 
for themselves. And I can do that. I, I work with people. I, I'm good with people. I, can, I understand Washington. I know how it works. And I'll do my best to lower the premiums for uh, those that uh, don't have the luxury of being part of the other programs. But also prescription drugs. And our president currently is working to reduce prescription drugs. And there's a doctor here in, the, in Newport Beach that I'm working with who's been briefing me up on where all the excess money is going. It's in between when they manufacture the drug and then you get the drug to your home. It's that middleman that takes so much money that that raises the price of, uh, of the prescription drug. So I'll work to lower the price of prescription drugs. And I think that's a key issue here in the congressional race. It certainly is. Greg, let's talk about veterans because you're obviously very qualified in this area. On your issue sub on gregrass.com, you talk about Trump's forever GI Bill, which gained 100% support in Congress, which is incredible. They don't talk about that on the media. But what I found interesting is how you mentioned it's important that we need to now enforce it and the key issues surrounding it for veterans, mental health aspects, and to properly help the veterans assimilate into the civilian life. And you even go into details further about their dignity and where to properly lay them to rest. And you really have carefully and thoughtfully considered our heroes in every aspect. So I'd like you to expand. Well, obviously me being a veteran, it's very important to me. My father was a World War II bomber pilot who flew in World War II over in Europe during D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, highly decorated bomber pilot. I took my cue from him. I have seven brothers and sisters. We grew up in Arizona. I always wanted to do what my father did, so I joined the military uh, Marine Corps officer program, and I became, as I said earlier, jet fighter pilot. And my son is uh, now a major in the military. He flies the F-18 himself. So we have three generations of military in our family. We've all been to combat. My father, World War II, I was in Desert Storm. My son was in Iraqi Freedom. We all wear the air medal because we've uh, been in uh, combat in, in our respective airplanes. So veterans mean a lot to me. And every hour on the hour, a veteran commits suicide. Every hour, 24 veterans a day commit suicide, and it's not letting up. I thought as we help the uh, veterans, uh, the VA system, this might let up. But there's a lot of problems. They see this terrible, terrible scourge of war, and they're in foxholes. They see their buddies blown up. It's, it's just so terrible, and they just can't. They get back to civilian life, and it's really hard to adjust. So I like to see the VA system, the Veterans Administration, uh, along with private practice to help these veterans that are having tr problems or struggling to get back into civilian life. It means a lot to me. And here in Orange County, I want to see a veterans hospital. Right now, we have to go all the way up to Long Beach, or we got to go all the way down to San Diego to uh, go to the hospital for any type of procedure. We do have a clinic in Laguna Hills, but it's very small. So I will really push for a veterans hospital here in Orange County. And and then I want a better a federal uh, national cemetery here in Orange County. We have to go to Riverside to be buried, or we have to go down to San Diego. There's a big, great park, if you remember, where the old El Toro Air Base, where I spent 20 years of my life, where I met my wife at the officer's club, just right out of Top Gun. I was sitting there at the bar, and she comes walking over. And that was 40 years ago. We've been married 38 years now with three wonderful kids. But that base is, I spent 20 years of my life. And when we shut down that base and sold it to a private enterprise in Irvine, and I believe it's uh, Five Point that's now uh, redeveloping it along with the uh, Irvine company, we were hoping to have 100 acres out of thousands of acres over there to have a nice, beautiful cemetery to uh, lay us to rest. So I will work at the national level as U.S. Congress congressman to bring federal dollars to Irvine so we can uh, have a, a cemetery right here for us that uh, served here and uh, that could be laid to rest here. It's really incredible. Greg, I love that national security is a tab on your issues. Not everyone talks about it on their website, but being a veteran, it's clear to see why you do. It's such a big issue. And you mentioned homegrown terrorism, international terrorism, manufactured global health crisis, nuclear weapons across the globe are problems that need to be addressed. So how should we address national security in Congress? Well, this administration, this president got a handle on uh, ISIS over there in the Middle East. He totally 
obliterated the uh, caliphate uh, that was in Iraq and Syria, and it was working their way up through Turkey. And he just did a phenomenal job. And uh, he, at, at the direct, obviously the military at his direction did a great job. And I'm so proud of my fellow military guys that that fought the good fight over there and put the end to the caliphate. And also, if you notice, since he's been president, domestic terror is just not happening. They know that not to mess with this president. And that's what's so good about him. He, what he says, he does. You know, if you mess with this president, as we saw with uh, Baghdadi, the uh, head of ISIS, who's dead, and uh, then the, the, uh, the guy from Iran who was visiting Iraq, Boom, he was gone. You, you mess with this president and then he'll, he'll, he'll retaliate. And uh, he does not appreciate it when foreign countries try to kill our citizens, especially our military personnel. So I'm a strong believer in a strong national security, a good military with up-to-date equipment, good ships, good rifles, good aircraft. And we have just some phenomenal machinery right now. And it was really, really going down the tubes toward the end of the Obama administration. Uh, the hardware was bad. The F-18 jets out of a squadron of 12, maybe two or three were working. The rest were all broken with the parts, parts issues that they weren't even manufacturing parts anymore. But the president put in like $2 trillion to the military, and it's all back up to speed. So I'm a strong uh, proponent of a strong national security. Don't mess with America. You mess with America, we'll come after you. And then uh, this president has laid the law down from day one. America first. Take care of the American citizens first. Take care of the American military first. And then we'll take care of our allies and those that we have treaties with. But if you're going to be an ally of ours, you better treat us right. You better uh, put up your fair share. If you're in NATO, you better be paying what you're supposed to pay. If you're over in Japan, you got to take care of us if you want our support. And I was based in Japan for a year and a half. And I'm wondering, why is America paying all this money to defend this country that's now doing very, very well? I could understand after World War II in the 50s, you know, to give them some support. But uh, nowadays, it's a thriving, uh, I believe it's the third largest uh, economy in the world uh, behind uh, the United States and China. So why are we paying for their defense? Same with South Korea. South Korea, I think, is the fourth largest economy or fifth largest economy. So... Um, I believe this president laid the law down. If you want our support, you're going to pay for it. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I wasn't really planning on talking about this, but you do have Israel on your issue, on your issues tab, which I love because I'm so pro-Israel. Um, and President Trump, from a national security standpoint, just did something really big, didn't he? He did everything that all the other presidents said they'd do. They changed the uh, move our embassy to what they considered their capital, Jerusalem. He moved an embassy off. President Bush said he'd do it. President Clinton said he'd do it. Obama said he would do it. No one did it. They, they used it in the campaign. But one thing about President Trump, he does what he says. And he did. And they, they annexed Golden, the Golden Heights. And I think they even named it the, the Trump Heights now or something like that. Yeah. But uh, I've been to Israel. I actually was there on a presidential trip with then President Clinton was the president. And I traveled over there with him. I saw him as a diplomat trying to work peace with then Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the prime minister. And uh, Yasser Arafat ran the PLO, and he was a master diplomat working with these two, but uh, he was never able to get a lasting peace. And I think we give President Trump four more years, I think, and this is probably the hardest ever to do, is get some type of peace uh, in, that, in that area of the world. But I think it can happen with uh, uh, his son-in-law, uh, work in the negotiations. I do too. And they signed an amazing agreement last week. With yes, with UAE. And they didn't have to trample on Israel's territory or do any, any um, you know, unfair trades or do anything. And they just, it was just such a peaceful agreement that just fell. Perfectly. Right. You got Egypt now, you got Jordan, and now United Arab Emirates. They've all established diplomatic ties with uh, Israel. Israel's not going anywhere. They have the 100% support of the United States and this president, and it behooved the other nations uh, in that area to make peace once and for all. And I don't see why they don't want to. I don't know why they want to live in this constant state of war. I, we kind of understood it why Arafat wanted to, because he was a military leader, and if they got to a peaceful solution, he'd be out of a job. But uh, it's time for peace in that, uh, that area of the world. And Iran is the big dog in the fight that everyone's kind of worried about. So they're all kind of joining forces if Iran 
Iran decides to make a move, uh, I think the uh, Arab states, along with Israel, would be ready to uh, push them back to their own territory. Greg, Orange County has seen its share of encampments and homeless problems, and I can't leave without talking about homelessness here because um, Orange County is arguably one of the wealthiest areas in America, as well as the world, yet we have homeless people living on the streets. So what is the problem in California and what aren't we doing? Okay, I'd I'd thank you for asking this question because this is a local issue. This is a city mayor issue, city council issue. The mayor needs to grab, grab the problem by the horn, which I did in Mission Viejo. We have no homeless in our city. Why? Because we have one deputy officer. Her job, is, she's a female deputy, Orange County Sheriff, is to go around looking for anybody that may be homeless, looking for some help. And we don't just throw them in the car and send them to L.A., we have several mercy homes in our city. We rent out homes and, and mercy home helps rehabilitate those that are homeless, uh, find out what their problems are. If they're a veteran, we send them to the Tyranny Center in Tustin where they can get some help. If they're, uh, for, for some reason, they're a student that's homeless, we help them with some type of housing. So when, which are happening in LA where there's thousands it's a local issue and that mayor should be fired. If there's any other mayors that let this happen, it's their problem. It's not a federal issue. It's not a state issue. It's a local issue. And the mayors and city councils need to get a handle on it. Yes, there's some problems here in Orange County, not that many, but there are. But those mayors of those cities, such as maybe Santa Ana and parts of, uh, uh, that's in LA County, but they need to get a handle on it one by one. And that's what we do. We I do a ride along when I was mayor. We did, I did a ride along with, with the police and I, with this one officer. We found a veteran living in a van. He's like 80 years old. I go, what are you doing living in a van? He goes, I go, you're a veteran. You have rights. You have uh, opportunities. And we're able to get him a house. We're able to get him clothes. We're able to get him a new car. And we got help through the Veterans Administration. He didn't know how to do it. So we helped him with that. And then we we're in the library, in Mission Via Library. And this guy, every morning, he's about 24. He'd come in with a suitcase when the library opened. He would stay all day till the library closed. And we sat down with him and go, what's your issue? He goes, well, I just want to go back to Kentucky, but I, I don't have any money. I said, well, if we give you a bus ticket, would you want to go? He goes, yes. So we get him a bus ticket and off he went. So it's one by one. You can't, once it gets out of control, once there's five and six, and then you have the encampments, and then you get the tents, and then you get more and more people, then it's out of control. So I blame uh, the local elected officials for letting this happen. So Greg, is there anything you'd like to say to our community? Yes, this is the Congressional 45th District, District 45. And you went through all the cities from Mission Bay all the way up to Villa Park. The largest city is Irvine. Mission Bay is a second followed by Lake Forest. Very Republican district. All 10 cities are run by Republican mayors. Both supervisors are Republican. Both state senators are Republican. Both assembly members are Republican. This is Republican and we got a Democrat Congresswoman. My job is ensure that this Democrat Congresswoman is a one-term Congresswoman. And my job is to get to Washington on, uh, on, G- on January 5th to represent everybody in this district and represent, and I will represent you well. So Greg Rass is my name. You can check me out. You can put my, on your, that's gregrass.com and uh, check me out. We're down to, uh, you know, just a few weeks left before election day, October 5th, ballots get mailed out. So we're getting very close to that. You get your ballots in the mail. Don't mail them back in. Walk them into a voting center, hand them to a person. Don't mail them in because they can get lost in the mail. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gray, for taking the time to speak with our community. Your unwavering support for the fight to keep America free, safe, and prosperous is obvious. And, and we're going to flip the 45th. And you exude eagle-like pride for our country. It has been such an honor to speak with you today. So thank you. Thanks to for having more, me. Thank you. To learn, more, <laughs> to learn more about Greg, please visit his website, www.gregrass.com. And please donate to his campaign. He can't do it alone. We don't have Hollywood elitists or Silicon Valley billionaires on our side, so we need your support to help get Greg elected. Thank you, Greg. All right. Bye-bye now.